Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Fitzgerald, the chairman of Triumph Over Phobia. Um, to those of you who don't know Triumph Over Phobia, we're a small charity, and we train group leaders to sort out phobias and OCDs, and the groups meet normally once a week, and we can achieve very significant improvement over usually four or five months um, at almost no cost to anyone at all. Uh, virtually all of us are entirely on a charitable basis without any reward, apart from seeing people cured, which is more important. I'm not going to talk very long. Um, I want to introduce you to Carol Stone, who is our most important patron. Carol has an extraordinary career. Um, I'm not going to tell you very much about the various roles she's fulfilled in the charities that she run, which are legion, but she is definitely the best contact person in London. Carol knows everybody. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. And if you need to know something about what people are doing in London, talk to Carol. I can't recommend it too strongly. Now I'm going to hand over to Carol. Well, thank you, Peter. What he means is I'm very nosy and I'm very old. But the, the reason I first got to know people was at the BBC for many years and I produced various editions of Woman's Hour and I produced the Any Questions programme for Radio 4 for many years and it got me into the way of meeting people and discussing issues and then I left there very long ago. I'm 75 in May, so I'm very old, but I'm very pleased to be here. So can I say... <laughs> Can I say that uh, anxiety, I'm, I don't know how many of it affects, I feel everybody. I certainly have had a life where I felt great tension and anxiety. I had a brother who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia who died of a stroke in his 40s and I've always been used to it surrounding me. And I was very, very lucky when I came across triumphophobia and knew what they could do. I always think they're like slimming clubs. They do self-help groups and people who have themselves suffered from whatever you're suffering from, whether it's being overweight or anxiety. So that's, that's why I'm very, very very pleased to be here and to be a patron. Um, I, the, the format for this evening is going to be three speakers. We've got Dr. Karen Fisher, we've got Dr. Chris Williams, and we've got Adam. And I can't remember Adam's surname, but I'm going to imagine Adam's Adam Shaw. Uh, and we're going to speak in that order with just a little one or two things in between. We're going to have a speaker for 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long, then 10 minutes of Q&A with that particular speaker. Same again. At the end of that, we're all going to sit down and we're going to do a general Q&A and finish at 8 o'clock. And those of you who are coming for dinner will get to know you a little bit more. So the whole point, I always used to say with any questions, we have a good panel and a terrible audience and it's a rotten show. So we hope you're, we've got a good panel. I hope you're going to be a very good audience, which means do react, do respond, because it's you we really want to hear from. Can I just say how many of you would say sitting in this audience, I don't know how you've all come here that you have it yourself experienced anxiety at some time well that's a pretty good response I think in the nicest possible way so thank you for saying that I'll now introduce you to our very very first speaker who is Dr Karen Fisher who I've only just met this evening but delighted to meet her a clinical psychologist who's been over 40 years in the NHS she up she upped that from 30, 40 years, specialises in CBT, but also in acceptance and commitment therapy, which I hadn't heard about, and mindfulness, which I have heard about. But tonight, I think she's going to concentrate on the physiological background to anxiety. Dr. Karen Fisher. Well, thank you very much. So, what I'm not sure is whether those of you who have experienced anxiety, which is most of you, um, uh, know more than I do about what I want to say about um, the biological aspects of it. So if, if you feel like I'm telling you stuff that you already know, then shout and I'll try and tell you something more interesting. Um, so uh, really, I mean, the whole business of stress, this was quite interesting. Uh, I used to run pain management programs and we used to run a, a module on stress management as a way of helping people manage pain. And I once asked uh, the group participants what they reckoned the definition of stress was and somebody in the, in, um, in the group uh, was an engineer and said stress is force divided by area and I thought well, that's very interesting that's it, that, that will translate exactly to what happens in the brain that stress is um, a, a situation with certain demands for which you've you, divided by the, the uh, resources that you perceive you've got to deal with it and if you, as we come on to talking about that a bit more, um, 
where the, result, the perceived resources uh, don't meet the demands of the situation, then you feel overwhelmingly stressed. And it's not a news to you, no doubt, that with any situation you have physical symptoms. Ooh, sorry. Physical symptoms. Um, emotions. Uh, thoughts and behavior. And they all interact. And one of the problems with chronic stress is that they interact to the extent that you never get a chance to get into a state where things begin to calm down. Um, if we start with evolution then, so in, in the dinosaur brain, you had these uh, structures in the brain stem, which you've still got, and they're very important. They, they um, keep you uh, alert and vigilant, and in fact, this is mostly where your areas of consciousness arise. So if you have any damage to your brain stem, the chances are that you're going to be unconscious and will probably snuff it because it um, also genera uh, um, generates the heart and breathing responses. And there will be some basic fear and aggression responses there as well. But as the brain evolved and you, you grew a limbic system, this became very important from the point of view of um, emotion and learning and memory. Um, and so a lot of the emotional responses that you feel. Oh, right. I'm, can this be turned? It's, it, it's probably because I'm tur actually turning away from it. Um, so the limbic system is about memory and, and emotion. And then finally, your brain developed with your neocortex, uh, which is particularly involved in planning and decision making, especially here in the frontal areas of the brain. Um, and of course that's a good, good thing because it means that you can learn, you do have intellect, but it's also a bad thing because it can keep the situation going on in imagination and, and rumination. Um, and then there are two kinds, two aspects to the autonomic nervous system which you're familiar with, no doubt, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and it's the sympathetic that gets things going, and the parasympathetic that tries to calm them all down. Um, so here we have the thalamus, um, which immediately receives information from the environment and sends it as a from a relay station to the amygdala here, which is this almond-shaped thing, and. Uh, eventually to the frontal cortex as well. Um, now, so what it does is the amygdala tries to tell you whether the situation is threatening or non-threatening, but it will tend to operate a better safe than sorry policy. So it'll readily trigger the hypothalamus, which then sends messages to prepare the body for um, the fight or flight response. Um, and it's, this is particularly interesting that this is still part of your um, primitive brain that the smell organs here uh, contact directly into the amygdala. So quite a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, will tell you it's the smell associated with the trauma that will act as a trigger for flashbacks rather more than uh, any other aspect of the, of the situation they were in. Um, so chemical transmitters convey information from one part of the brain to another. And as I was just saying, the thalamus amygdala, the hypothalamus pathway is an a, a, a expressway, but the way into the cortex, the um, decision-making part of the frontal lobes particularly, is more like a slow boat to China. And th th what happens here is that you feel <coughs> the um, ex effects of the stressor in your body before you've had a chance to really evaluate what the stressor is. So the, the, the um, effects of the battery system um, giving you the adrenaline surge will in fact um, alert you to the fact that you're in a stressful situation before you've had a chance to evaluate how, how threatening this really is. And in themselves, they, those, those um, physiological responses are stressful and telling you something is going on and will tend to um, alert the cortex to the fact that you're dealing with something really quite important. 
um, the limbic system, as we've said, will add more. Ooh, will add more um, memory and emotional aspects to your experience. So the um, limbic system will tell you whether you've dealt with this situation before and and whether your responses to it were effective. So here you go with your hypothalamus alerting the pituitary gland, gland to, to um, get the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol and adrenaline. And these are the effects that you're familiar with in your body. So the cortisol will, re will release glucose and, uh, to help the muscles and the heart rate and blood pressure um, to get ready to, for your fight and flight reaction. But it's also an anti-inflammatory, so uh, this is why we think some people can go through quite serious injury without feeling pain until after the uh, stressor is reduced. And adrenaline, you're very familiar with, um, increases sweat sweating and heart rate and drives oxygen to the heart and so on. And so this is what happens um, that you're familiar with. You, you notice that your muscles get tense and your heart... In, uh, heart rate increases, you may get palpitations and you sweat because you're trying to lose heat to allow the body to um, act more quickly, uh, you, your breathing speeds up and all the time um, this, the adrenaline surge is causing your blood pressure to increase and energy for the muscles is being released by the glucose, the digestion slows, or and the, it says here sphincters close, but in fact the sphincters will tend to open first, which is why you have to rush off to the loo if you certainly get an adrenaline surge. And then after that, the digestion processes are put on the back burner. And this is what is meant by the body keeps the score. You quite often, in anxiety cases, you quite often say to the patient, where in the body do you feel it? Because this gives you some clue as to how the, how the body is um, dealing with the, the problem. However, we do have a brain, as we just said, the cortex uh, is trying to evaluate the situation, trying to tell us whether it's as stressful um, as, as the adrenaline, adrenaline surge might make it feel like. And we knew this 400 years ago, but we've lost track of it since. And it's only within the last 40, 50, 60 years or so, that we've, we've come back to looking at whether it's, you know, whether the, how the brain interprets situations to say whether this is a good or bad situation. Um, so what the brain is doing is happening rather more slowly than the body has, all, uh, the body's reactions that have already got started. Um, and we can see this. So in, in this situation where the plants, plant, you hear the plant pots fall over on your doorstep, you, you might interpret that as saying, well, it's a burglar. And then the emotion that follows from that will be your panic ang and anxiety and fear reaction. And your behavioral response to that will be whatever is, is relevant to your panic uh, response. And the whole thing forms a, a very logical sequence. So starting off with interpreting the event as being a burglar, then this um, train of, of uh, responses will fall into place almost without you needing to think about it. However, if you interpret it, the, the plant pot's falling over is due to your cat, then you might feel pleasure or relief if it's your cat or be a bit annoyed if it's always your neighbor's cat that knock your plant pots over. And then your behavior will again form a logical pattern with your interpretation of the event. So this is where the cognitive behavior therapy bit comes in. How you interpret the event will enable you to um, have something to say about the physiological responses in your body. So here you have decision time. Because the mental systems arrive later, as we just said. So when you've got your adrenaline surge, do I have the resources to cope with this? Yes, that's okay then. I'm, my limbic system is telling me I'm familiar with this situation, so my stress reaction can stop. But if it's telling me, no, I'm not familiar, then I get this alarm response. The body prepares for extra, maintain fight or flight. I make another decision a bit later on. Is my response effective? 
And if yes, okay, that's fine. So I've actually got myself out of the dangerous situation. I can now relax and the stress response stops and my parasympathetic nervous system takes over. But if the answer to that question is no, my response hasn't been effective, I'm still highly het up and I don't understand what to do next, then you would get possibly into a state of chronic anxiety where it gets worse and the nervous system becomes more sensitive and more easily triggered into a, a stress and panic response. Now this is quite a nice little um, cartoon I got off the internet, but it's completely wrong, completely the wrong answer because this character here, I went through a whole lecture in which the person presenting called this a giraffe, but never mind, this giraffe type, type animal here um, will notice that the, the threat, the lioness, has slunk off back to the savannah and the parasympathetic nervous system will now begin to take over with its acetylcholine and will undo the um, effects of the ad adrenaline and, and cortisol. And so this zebra character can return to... So we called um, the sympathetic system fight or flight. The parasympathetic system they call feeding and breeding, uh, which requires a certain amount of relaxation within the system. So this zebra is unable to keep the idea of the lioness possibly re reappearing within the next five minutes. Once the, he, the lioness is slunk off, the stress response stops in the, in the zebra. Unfortunately though, because of our cortex and particularly our thinking areas and our well, decision making in our frontal lobes, um, we, we will keep reliving or pre-living to the extent that uh, we can keep this experience alive in imagination. We can believe that the lioness is still around or the stressor will recur or the stressor is still present because we're still imagining it in um, uh, visual imagery in our minds. So the, the stress hormones um, will keep on the boil. And uh, this being the case, the hippocampus, which is to do with memory and learning, um, actually cortisol looks like it's actually dam it's damaging the hippocampus to the extent that you know, it actually gets smaller in conditions of chronic stress. So clearly memory and learning, so people who are highly anxious, as I'm sure you've appreciated, will say, I, I have such difficulty concentrating, I can't remember things and I can't learn anything new. So, um, and, all, and, and the more that cells fire together, wire together, you, c you can see how it it um, builds up a pattern where the stress response in the brain is becoming so tied together, as it were, that it can be very easily triggered and your parasympathetic response doesn't ever get a chance to get um, on top of it. So, as I was saying, the usual autonomic nervous system will uh, increase the rest and, rest and relax and rest transmitters when the stressor is over. Uh, but as cells become more excitable, um, they become this, this, wind, this is called wind up, where things get more easily triggered um, to the extent that small in, even small increases in arousal will then put you into a state of panic. I'm sure you've experienced that. So here you go, so, so what's happening is you're driving the children to school and you hear a screech of car brakes and the, the, this information goes to the thalamus and the brain perceives it as an indicator of threat and we get the full biological response we've just talked about. Now, so, so you feel anxiety and muscle tension and nausea and fear of losing control and all those things. And your mental response is, this is serious and I can't cope, I don't have the resources to deal with this, but actually that's a thinking error and Chris will talk more about that. And so your behavioural response in this wind-up situation might be to try and escape, you rush home and you eventually avoid driving altogether. Um, and the result of all that is that your quality of life gradually closes, closes down and chronic stress will lead to this loss of confidence and coping skills and uh, increased depression eventually and some of you may have experienced all that. So the biological symptoms that w were intended to make us more able to deal with the stress have now become 
inefficient and are actually holding us up. So instead of lots of ideas here that might get us out of the situation, instead of that we've now got a headache and the muscles are now permanently tense and cause pain um, and we've got permanent breathing problems and palpitations that affects our um, gas exchange so we get tingling and numbness in the extremities. The whole uh, digestive system tends to be chronically disturbed and sweating continues uh, to pathological ex extents. Um, especially in post-traumatic stress disorder, we find that the um, traumatic memories appear to be stored in a frozen state, isolated state, um, that other information processing systems can't access, so no updating information can be um, uh, uh, brought into play to, to try and deal with these isolated memories. No learning can take place and no resolution of the stress response can occur. And we know that this keeps the cortisol system going that will, uh, as I say, have feedback into the hippocampus. So, um, so people are chronically unable to get out of these reliving experiences until such time as these in intrusive memories are uh, dealt with with specific techniques. There are some things we can do about the um, physiological uh, systems uh, involved in anxiety. For many, many years, in fact, this deep muscular relaxation was first described in about 1930, and for many years we've been teaching people this uh, these techniques, I dare say, you've learned a few of them yourself. Um, there are imagery techniques as well, hypnotic techniques, um, imagery te techniques specifically around your particular stressor. Um, but more uh, modern techniques involve mindfulness, which to my mind, in a way, is more, more honest, because here we're trying to say, okay, so we've got these tense muscles, let's try and change that situation and make them more relaxed and do some exercises to, to get in touch with how the muscle, what the muscle states feel like and how we, can, how we can modify that. Whereas mindfulness is saying, don't try and be anything different, just accept what you've got at the moment. And the, and the uh, acceptance commitment therapy th people will say, the problem of trying to change, the problem of control is the problem. So if you can learn through mindfulness to accept that there will be a certain amount of muscle tension, not to try and change it, not to try and get somewhere else, but just to stay where you're at, then the whole thing becomes less, um, less into a vicious circle, much easier for you to accept and deal with it. And I think in, in some ways this is more successful. I don't know whether you've had experience of that, but um, that's where we're going at the moment, I think. And so maybe, maybe there is a function to worry that is, has some benefits for you, but maybe not. Thank you very much. If we, can we have the lights on up here? Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. If you could remain standing just a bit longer and talk yes, into yeah. the microphone. All right, yeah. And uh, have we got any questions and answers? And Anyone got a question or an answer? Or a question, even, would help? Question? Yes. Question. What happens? Ah, um, wh uh, where are you? Uh, Not the back. Oh, okay. If you could stand up, it would be very helpful. And could you say who you are? And if, have you got any connection at all with, with um, mental illness or the medical profession? Or anything I'm, here because of my, I'm here because of my daughter. This is true of his mother. Um, well done. Thank you. What, is it common for people who are suffering uh, post-traumatic stress to resist uh, trying to um, resolve it? Can they spend a lot of time living with it without resolving it oh. and still suffering from anxiety? Absolutely. They can't do anything about it. Absolutely right. I saw some guy the other day that, that had had post-traumatic stress disorder over 30 years and I had various sessions of um, counselling and different kinds of therapy, uh, but none of it had really addressed the problem. And the part, uh, one of the problems with post-traumatic stress disorder is sometimes the stressor 
is obviously too difficult for the patient to deal, to, to deal with or even to um, articulate and also quite difficult for some therapists to deal with as well. So there's a sort of payoff between the two of them where neither is getting to grips with it and we know that it only uh, trauma-focused therapy is going to help. So at some point we need to say to the patient um, all these reliving experiences that you're having is the brain trying to process uh, the information that is still locked away with all its emotion attached to it. And until we can get to a point where that emotion can be allowed to subside, then the reliving experiences will continue. Um, and so gradually, gradually, we get people to focus on the, the, the actual dealing directly with the trauma before any change can can take place. Would you agree with that, Paul? No. Mostly. Mostly. Well, there you are. So there's, there's different ideas about that. But. Okay. Any other questions? Is it because you're perplexed and you don't know what to do with it? Is that why you understand it also when you have no question? I, I can't understand really. Here we are. Question here. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm very interested in um, uh, trauma-focused therapy, and I was interested in what you had to say on how would you um, treat intrusive thinking as a result of trauma, past trauma. Well, th there's a number of things you can do, and there are a number of techniques, and you know, it's horses for courses. It depends what the patient or the client um, can deal with. I mean, one of the things is. Uh, one of the old techniques is prolonged exposure in imagination. So you get the person to continuously go over and over and over the thoughts that they're having. Um, another thing, one is narrative therapy, where you're actually getting the patient to write as much as they can about what they remember. Um, another one is EMDR, if you if you're interested in that. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. I, d I use it. It's particularly useful where people can't articulate the trauma. You don't have to hear it, or they don't have to articulate it. Um, but I don't like the fact that it's, you can't explain what's going on. It's, you have to sort of pass it off as some kind of magic. I think EMDR works. Oh, definitely. It's, it's helpful. But I think all that's happening is it's allowing this prolonged uh, exposure and imagination. Um, and I, d I really don't know, I don't know whether Paul can shed any light on it, I really don't know what the point of the, the bilateral stimulation is. I'm not sure whether that's got something to do with in trying to do something with the hip hippocampus. I can't really tell you. But. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I just would like to understand. Oh, sorry. Um, Solange Fossil Lambert. Um, originally from London, but live in Bath for the past five years. Anything connected with the medical profession? No, not at all. I'm just in interested because I've got a very anxious child, but I'm a I've I'm a very anxious woman basically. But um, I just kind of w wanted to find out how uh, you know whether it, it is how children can having been a child myself and growing up in a sort of civil war um, for many, many years. Right. And having picked up on the fact that through smell that you can trigger memory and things. Um, having gone back to Angola where I was born um, in 2003, um, just literally on, on landing and leaving the aeroplane and having a particular smell of a particular fish that I recall was the only thing that we had to eat for many, many years, right. triggered all the emotion that I had blocked from having left the country at the age of seven. So I don't really know how you can explain how a child, you know, can block all of those memories for X amount of years, and then all of those memories came flushing back on on landing after 25 years of never having been on in that place, basically. Well, and the, the, the fancy word is dissociation. That mm. children particularly, I think, are quite good at it, because they're quite, quite good at, at um, 
living in fairy tale fairy tales. They're quite good at imagining things. So it's it's quite good for the, the, that they can, in some instances, just put them put those experiences in some part of their mind that they don't revisit, and they they develop a person, as another persona that hasn't exp apparently experienced those things. Um, and by not you know, we, we showed that little picture of yeah. cells firing together and, and the experience setting up these pathways, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, readily t uh, triggered pathways. By not revisiting the trauma situation, you're not setting up those easily accessible pathways. You're, you're dealing with the persona that you've developed that doesn't have access to that information. And children are particularly good at that, I think. Um, and so that's why you have to try and access, if you know the person has experienced some kind of trauma, you have to try and access it via more imaginative techniques than you perhaps use with an adult, because you can't necessarily get it from talking. Mm. Uh, I, I wouldn't find that surprising at all, really. Thank you very much. Right, thank you.